up on it, and then we'll go up. There you go. It's good. So the first letter in TED is technology. So I'm going to wow you with my technology here, which is a rope or a line for the sailors in us. Our weather is very difficult to monitor, to predict, to forecast, and so forth. But meteorologists have a pretty good idea of what's going on. You know, if you live in certain areas, there's persistence forecasting, which is sort of straight line weather. What you see is what you get, and it's repeated day after day after day. Nice, San Diego, energy free, no AC, no heat, windows open, fresh air. OK. Now, what's happened across the, the world, really, is that our weather has changed in a way that we're not really sure what's going on. Now, I could make a loop, and we talk about cycles and four season climates. We are in a four season climate. We're at 40 degrees north latitude, three months of each season. But what I'm suggesting right now is through global climate change and the runaway greenhouse emissions, this is what has happened to our weather systems. Okay? So I am just very simply knotting a rope or a line. Okay? This is the weather mess that we have right now. Now this knot is not going to untie itself. We, as an international society, have to make changes in order to free up this congestion or this entanglement. Right now, I can very leisurely just untie this. I hope I don't get stuck. Okay, So you can keep untying this line, and we can get back to something that we're reasonably comfortable with. My message today is one of optimism and hope. We have a lot of talented people in the world. We've created a situation that we recognize as an international community is compromised. It's in trouble. We can fix it. That's probably my central message. And I will give you a lot of details. In case you have forgotten what the globe looks like, this is our planet. Okay, it's basically a blue planet with a limited amount of land. Now when you look at a globe, you see countries and borders, natural and man-made. But guess what? The atmosphere has no borders. The atmosphere is shared. What's going on in China and India is affecting the rest of the world. What's happening in the US is affecting the rest of the world. Everything. Okay? So the atmosphere is distributed evenly around the globe. It's shared. 2015 and 2014, our last two record years, tax years, were the hottest on record in New York. Sea level has risen by eight inches on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Flooding from Florida up through the Carolinas has not occurred at this level in 28 centuries. The news is just in. This is startling. Just last year in the Persian Gulf, in Mecca, Meteorologists are measuring wet bulb temperatures of 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, wet bulb temperatures should be depressed or less than dry bulb temperatures. So what does this mean? 95 degrees is the wet bulb temperature. It means everybody's sweating to death. Okay? This is so humid, this air mass, that you can't cool off our bodies. We, as humans, have a narrow temperature range of comfort. Now, what did they do? In Mecca, they erected 
misting irrigation systems that those that were participating in Mecca walked under and they got misted so that they didn't succumb to heat stroke. Is this how we want to live? I don't think so. There's a lot of evidence that global emissions are what is really at the cause of all of this. There are naysayers that say, gee, hasn't the earth gone through climate change before? Haven't there been times of extensive glaciation and times of heat? The answer is yes, but guess what? They're on cycles of 100,000 years, not a dozen years. The difference between weather and climate is only 30 years. Weather is daily, daily conditions of the atmosphere. You pick up the New York Times, you look at the weather report. It has a map, it shows fronts, high and low pressure systems, it gives you a forecast. Climate is looking at 30 years of temperature and precipitation data. I would argue that from 1986 to 2016, our 30 year block, we are experiencing new weather. This year, they had to put the word Godzilla in front of the El Nino event. Okay, so as Kelly mentioned in the introduction, our weather has gone wild. Now, I think the reason it was in the 50s and 60s in New England in November and December, this is weeks, weeks at a time, is that our atmosphere has been compromised. And the El Nino event, which is very complicated, which is basically a upwelling of warm water off of Peru, okay, so we have a visual here. Look at the size of the Pacific Ocean, okay, off of Peru. This tremendous upwelling was measured early in the summer. During an El Nino event, there is upwelling and warming of this water, but the size of this, this is a huge mass. What happened was California got the rain, the Cascades and the Rockies got tremendous snow. We got elevated temperatures and very little snow. Now my daughter just started at the University of Vermont. We got her all this cold weather gear, ski passes, <laughs> spent a fortune on leasing skis and everything. Haley, how's it going? I've only skied four days, Dad. It's been raining. And there's actually no snow outside the dorm, which is very unusual. Now, OK, last winter there was a lot of snow, granted. But you know, even Bernie Sanders, when he was campaigning in Burlington, Vermont, was saying, this is not normal. He was up there in December. He didn't even need a jacket. Burlington can be brutal, Burlington brutal, in terms of cold temperatures. Okay, we're not having it. So it's my contention that this Godzilla event this year has been augmented by this high carbon level in the atmosphere that's been unprecedented. So it's grabbing this anomaly, and it's showing what it can do. Now, yes, we had a 26.8-inch snowstorm. I happened to be, I went away that weekend on Friday to go skiing in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. Well, guess what? I got up there thinking, wow, this is going to be great. The snow never made it. Okay? All of the ski areas didn't get snow this year. Areas that didn't need it did. Why does Washington, D.C. need two feet of snow? Why does Maryland and Philadelphia and New York City? It's a real hassle. We as urban areas know that we just can't run our businesses and schools and so forth when 
we get 26 inches of snow. Ski areas know what to do. They pack it down and people enjoy skiing the slopes. We don't have it. When you start looking at deep time, particularly the solar system and Earth, you have to expand your mind a bit and start thinking astronomical time, geologic time. Our planet formed with the rest of the planets in the solar system at about the same time, the solar nebular hypothesis, about 4.6 billion years ago. So everything was starting then and progressing. We on Earth have waited 3.5 billion years to go from simple bacteria to us. Think about that. <laughs> That's not an easy process. We are at a pivotal point in our history as a species. The planet is going to survive. The planet is going to be around for another 4.6 billion years. Our sun is halfway through the main sequence stage of stellar evolution. It is shining steady. Yes, there is something known as helioseismology. Yes, there's slight changes in solar output. But basically, the sun's like this. Now, we have a choice. Do we want to be part of this future? I think so. There are a lot of things that we can do as individuals, as a country, as an international group. The climate talks in Paris just ended a couple of months ago. 185 industrial countries were there that represent more than 98 percent of the global greenhouse emission gases which we now know are tied to climate change and elevated temperatures. So here's the group. They were there. Now, what is going to happen? There were action plans. The United States has a clean power plan to start to bring down our emissions and lower the carbon level. Well, guess what? The Supreme Court of the United States of America voted down five to four to act on this. So we're not doing anything. Okay, right now, uh, China is actually reducing their levels. I don't know if you saw the front page of the New York Times a couple of days ago. They had the coal production with the white plumes coming from the smokestacks, but you could actually see blue sky between them. So they're trying to say they're doing their part. The most polluted city in the world is now in India, New Delhi. They passed. Beijing, China in 2014. How are they coping with it? Well, you know what's a new industry? Designer breathing masks. Okay, you may have seen the article in the Times about this. Okay, there's a company in San Francisco, California that is making a fortune making designer masks that the teenagers and young students are now wearing as fashion statements to go to and from school. And this is how they're coping with it with a little bit of humor. But wouldn't you like to take the mask off and breathe some fresh air? I think so. The hope is that it can be done. There are so many ways to generate clean power. There are solar farms everywhere. Now, when you drive up north, you see them. Instead of dairy cows, you have solar panels growing out of the fields. If you look at the ridges in the Berkshires and other areas with a similar topography, you see wind turbines. They are collecting wind and generating electricity without elevating the temperature of the atmosphere. And they're doing it in a clean way. Another point that I want to just illustrate, you know, we're a water planet. 71% of the Earth is blue. 
think of all the coastlines on all the land masses. And guess what? Waves, currents, and tides endlessly slap at the coast. That's your power. It can be done. You just have to do it. Now, bicycles are changing the way cities work, the way cities are functioning. How many of you, just a show of hands, ride a bicycle for recreation? Hands up. Pretty good. How many of you ride bicycles for transportation? See, not many. I know the roads are dangerous, okay? But just think, I'm in Hastings on Hudson. I take my bicycle to Antoinette's, the local coffee shop. I ride into town to the bank, to the post office. I go home. I always get parking. It's very easy on your bike. You get some exercise. You feel the day. A lot of us just go from indoor space to indoor space, and we don't really appreciate what we have. We actually have pretty clean air for a New York metropolitan area. Nationwide, there are about a million commuters by bicycle, one million. New York City has a city bike share program that is actively used. Just a show of hands, does anybody ride the city bikes? OK, we have a couple of representatives. OK, this is good. I have five bicycles. I have five bicycles Okay, for different purposes. I like to have my own bike. I bring a folding bike with me on the train, Metro North. I get off in Grand Central, and I ride all through the city. All you know, from Grand Central down to Union Square, West Village, go over to Chelsea Piers, go to the East Village. You don't even notice it. You're just getting places really fast, and you're out in the open air. And wherever you want to stop, there's always a place to lock up your bike. OK, so I mean, you can get into this. Tourists are coming into New York, and they're putting their card in the slot, and they're taking the city bikes out for a run. This is a good thing to do. It's hard to change governments. There's a lot of resistance in politics to handling global climate change. I think if some of the politicians that were saying no were all of a sudden going to live for 200 years, they might do something about it. The tendency is, look, I'm OK. I'm probably only going to live another 20, 30 years. You know. Let the next generation solve the problem. But what if you are that generation? What can you do? Very simple things. You manage your home, your apartment. You can turn the thermostat down by a degree or two in the winter. You don't have to do icy cool air conditioning in the summer. You can replace old appliances, washing machines, air conditioners. They, take, they drain a lot of electricity, clean filters. Combine trips, try to get away from the car, use mass transit. There are things that you can do. I know the quote, writing to your congressman, you know, this doesn't really help. But if everybody sort of assesses their own carbon footprint and tries to reduce it, we can make progress as an international society. Thank you.